have become new. All right, I'm going to let you be seated. And I'm going to read something to you that I think you'll see how it will blend into our study today. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. I'm going to read this first, Sue, and then we'll do the song that we normally do. Genesis 39 will be our t chapter today. We have a faithful group of people in this church. We still have a lot of people that are not here because of coronavirus, but we're glad you're here today. Most importantly, we must have the Lord here. We support several really good works. We support Grace Centers of Hope up in Michigan, and they take people off the streets, uh, and they don't just feed them and sleep them. Uh, they give them jobs. They make them accountable to someone. They give them responsibility. And a good work by my old friend Kent Clark, the way you can remember Kent. You remember Superman's name? What was his name? Clark Kent. Well, his name is Kent Clark. He signed in one time at a motel. I was with him. And you have to put your last name first. And when he wrote Clark, comma, Kent, the receptionist looked at him and said, sure. <laughs> but that's a good work. We also support a man down in the island of Dominica. His name is Dan Shanks. And I've known Dan for 35, 40 years. In fact, I knew him before he was converted. His father was Jack Shanks, pastored in Houston, Texas for many, many years. And Danny and I correspond, and this church supports him, a good work. We also support a work in Africa, in South Africa. Uh, Dr. Foster has sent them 540 Bibles, something like that. That's Nigeria, all right, so wrong continent, but right, right to, to send it to Bible. Okay, right, but what, how many Bibles have you sent them? That's my point. 540, 500 and something Bibles, and he says that's Nigeria, and then in South Africa, we also support some missionaries there who have a school, and they teach young people and young ministers the gospel, kind of like a seminary Bible school. Well, here's what Danny wrote. Following a routine coloscopy, it's up on the board if you want to read along with me, on Tuesday morning at the hospital this week, the doctor informed me Wednesday morning that surgery was required to remove what they found because of the size of it. That I very naively overlooked. As soon as she told me that, I thought with a smile of these words that I had said to you. It's too soon for any further details, though. Here in Dominica, it takes about a week for the lab results to come back. We'll know then if it's benign, but they're setting me up for surgery as soon as possible. What does the world sound like at times like this? We hear it constantly. They exclaim, OMG, oh my God, no. It's amusing to watch. Those who are lost, who have no hope in Christ and are totally ignorant of the sovereignty of God are exposed by such outburst. They're blind to the malignity of sin and its just deserts in their case, and they certainly know nothing of it in my case, how God in the midst of these things deals so tenderly and so lovingly with his own that it's perfectly in line with his gracious plan and design that he, on purpose, brings these afflictions into our lives for none other than their good and his glory. That doesn't diminish the pain and the suffering one whit. It hurts, but it's supposed to. It's an ordeal. It's supposed to be. But the true believer knows what's happening, that this is none other than the very hand of their heavenly Father, who is himself busy at work. He's out working in the garden. He's doing some pruning on those fruit-bearing branches that are connected to Christ. 
he takes that knife and with precision he cuts over here and over there and again and again. Cutting hurts. Cutting causes sharp pain, but he's cutting away those things that are undesirable and useless. And it all has to do with the bringing forth of more fruit in the lives of his children. They're good in his glory. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. John 15, verses 1 and 2. Pruning is a very necessary part of being conformed to the likeness and the image of Christ, who himself was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53, 3. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, Hebrews 5 and verse 8. So I'll be going under the knife soon, both physically and spiritually. Just another opportunity for you to call my name in prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that is a testimony right there. That's a testimony of a man, in my opinion, who knows his God, uh, and his God knows him. And therefore, as he said, it's no fun. But he realizes, as I'm going to tell you time and again in today's study, it's for our good and it's for his glory. Stand up together with me one more time. Let's ask the Lord to, to help us. like to ask the Lord to help us before we open his word. Help me in teaching and help you in listening. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. Passage reading is Genesis chapter 39, and it is verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word, and let God's people say, Praise the Lord. And you may be seated. Joseph is now in prison for doing the right thing. His problem started when he did the right thing regarding his brothers. He did the right thing when he told his father, Jacob, the truth about what his brothers were doing. It was deemed an evil report in the sense that he told the truth about their evil doings. And then in Genesis chapter 39, where we are now, we find that Joseph did the right thing regarding the wife of Potiphar, the Egyptian to whom he had been sold. And for his righteous conduct, he was accused of rape and thrown into prison. So that was the price for doing the right thing. The second point I wish to make is the potency of Jacob's faith. God-given faith is a potent thing. You see, though Joseph was falsely accused, he did not defend himself. To defend himself would have been to condemn his accusers. And I have suggested that in this very case, Joseph reminds us of our Savior who, when he was accused, did not defend himself. Why? 
Well, he suffered his accusers to have their way with him for our sakes. Had our Savior defended himself, he would have been acquitted by the courts of heaven. He would have been found not guilty. But at what price? The condemnation of those he came to save. You remember when he was hanging on the cross and he had those two thieves? And then that crowd was standing around and they were all saying the same thing. He can't save himself. They said he saved others, but he can't save himself. How right they were, but they didn't realize it. If he had saved himself, we'd have to perish. And so he did not defend himself for our sakes. This is my testimony. In the words of the songwriter, I was guilty with nothing to say. And they were coming to take me away. But then a voice from heaven was heard that said, Let him go and take me instead. And I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. It's Mrs. Potiphar who should have been disgraced and sent to prison, not Joseph, but he did not defend himself. And she went free from all accusation and all guilt. And because our Savior did not save himself, we go free. Third point I wish to make is the persuasion of Joseph's faith. The persuasion of Joseph's faith. I think I see somebody trying to get in out there. I'm not sure if one of you brothers would take care of that. The persuasion of Joseph's faith. Joseph did not try to save himself because he was persuaded that God was for him. See, he was completely resigned to the will of the Lord, and thus he was able to submit in faith to the hand that divine providence dealt him. And you don't read one word in the Scripture of murmuring from the lips of of Joseph because of any of the events that befell him. Joseph knew that nothing could happen to him. This is what Danny said. Nothing could happen to him that was not permitted by the God of heaven. And since he trusted him, he was able to submit to him in faith, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the consequences. What was the basis of Joseph's faith? What was the foundation of it? What supported him during these times of trial? I believe that the Word of God came to him in those dreams that he had that we considered months ago. Those dreams were the Word of God to him and the will of God for him. And so regardless of the valleys that he has to pass through, he was enabled by divine grace to tenaciously hold on to the hope that was given him from above that nothing and no one could turn back what God had ordained for him. And this is our lot also, isn't it? Haven't we been given a dream from heaven that came through the gospel? A dream that heaven is our destiny? that heaven is our promised land, and that we will reign with Christ? And do we not confess ourselves to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth and citizens of heaven? And don't we often need reminding that this world is not our home? I think Joseph was reminded often by reflecting on that Word of God that came to him through those dreams. We have to be reminded that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're only here for a little while. But while we are here, how will we survive? We will survive the same way Joseph survived. It's simple, but it's profound. He believed God. He survived through faith in a word from God. The betrayal of his brothers did not shake his faith in his God. Being sold into slavery did not shake his faith in his God. Being falsely accused and thrown into prison could not shake his faith in God. 
And so, beloved, we can survive and we can even thrive while we are in this world by believing our God. It is by faith that we stand on the promises given to us to all who come to him, to come to Jesus as the Messiah, who himself has said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That's a promise we have from him in John chapter 10. And my friends, keep the promise of heaven with Christ always before you. Because this will sustain you, and this will strengthen you, and this will take you through every trial now and in the future. John says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 and verse 4. So like Joseph, through faith, we are able to endure all that is thrown at us in this fallen world and by this fallen world. The Lord is our defense. The Lord is our avenger. The Lord is our strong tower. The Lord is our shield. The Lord is our buckler. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our fortress. And when we call upon him, he will hear us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us. He will keep us safe in the fold of the good and the great shepherd. Now I want you to listen carefully to me now. When Jesus said, I am the way, he was not speaking of a philosophy, but he was speaking of salvation. He was speaking of safety. He was speaking of the means of all blessings. The divine means of getting through this world is to walk as Jesus walked. Say, how is that? Well, the way to walk as he walked is to walk with him. If we have been called to faith in him, we have been called by grace to walk with him. And if we walk with him daily, we will follow in his steps after the examples that he left us. And we should always remember that anything we suffer in this world is far less than we deserve and infinitely less than our Savior suffered. You remember the thief who was crucified with Christ, and he said, just before he died, he said, this man, speaking of Jesus, has done nothing wrong. But we are getting what we deserve. Luke chapter 23. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Even Chris Christopherson knows something of this truth. Remember the song that he wrote, Why me, Lord, what have I ever done deserve, to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you or the kindness you've shown? Now, I've told you these things this morning both to encourage you and to set the stage for today's study. I'm going to show you, God willing, and I live, in the next two or three weeks, I'm going to show you that the basis of all of our troubles in this world, all of our troubles, from the very foundation of the world, the basis of it is slander. It was the slanderer, the word devil, translated diabolos, means slanderer. It was the slanderer who slandered God to Adam. Has God said that you may not freely eat of all the trees of the garden? And uh, Eve said, oh, we may eat of all the trees of the garden, but the tree that's in the midst of the garden, this forbidden tree, God has said, we shall not eat of it. And the serpent slandered God, and he said, oh, he doesn't want you to eat of that because then you'll be like him. Your eyes will be open." And you will be able to determine for yourself, without his help, what is good and what is evil. And all of the lies and all of the things that come from it came from that 
slanderer in the Garden of Eden. And I'm going to try to open that up to you in the next couple of weeks. Now listen, there are two reasons behind anything that happens in a world like this one. A world is created by a sovereign God. You know what they are? Either He permits it to happen, or He causes it to happen. Now we can get theological, I can talk to you about the permissive will of God, what God permits. I can talk to you about the causative will of God, what God causes to happen. We can speak of the decretive will of God, what God has decreed will happen. We can think of the revealed will of God, what God has revealed to us, what we know. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things that are revealed belong to us. I could talk to you about the prescriptive will of God. That's the written word of God, but it usually points with an emphasis to the commands within the written word. But just get this bottom line fact. The fact that something happens means God either permitted it or He caused it. Now, if you have faith... In the God of the Bible, that's the God you have to deal with. And that's what Danny said. Danny said, I think the Lord's going to do a little pruning with me. Joseph was able to go through this trial because he trusted the Lord. Now let me throw you a, a kind of a curve here. The fact that something is permitted to happen does not mean always that the Lord approves it, or approves of it. For example, when the Lord made man, how many wives did He give him? We gave him one. He said you have to have one wife at a time, <laughs> not two or three. But He later permitted men to multiply wives unto themselves. It doesn't mean He approved it, but He did permit it. So the bottom line, once again, is nothing can happen in a world created by a divine and sovereign God without His knowledge or without His permission. And it would have been a comfort to Joseph to know that the Lord knew all about his imprisonment and that somehow it would work for his good and God's glory and divine purpose. Most of us are like the man that was in the meeting and the preacher was saying that he was going to get up a busload to heaven. And he asked him, do, uh, any, uh, do all of you want, does anybody here want to go to heaven? Well, of course, everybody raised their hand and said, you want to go to heaven? Come down here to the front. He went on like that for 15 minutes, and in a few minutes, everybody was down to heaven. But one man, he was back in the back. One guy. And the preacher said, sir, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, of course I do. He said, well, why didn't you come down? He said, I thought you were getting up a load for this afternoon. I want to go, but I don't want to go today. And let me tell you this, one day, your day and my day is coming up. And all the medicine you can buy and all the doctors you can hire will not be able to discharge you, in the words of Solomon. He said, no man can be discharged from that war. When God says, your time is up, your time is up. And it's coming around. And I want to know that I'm prepared. I want to know that I've been walking with the Lord here so that when something happens, it's not going to come as a surprise to me. It's not going to change anything. I've been walking with Him, and so I'll just walk right on out of this life and into eternity. You know, the Scripture indicates the New Testament written in the Corne Greek. Corne means common. And it says that when Jesus died on the cross, it said His head rested and on his shoulder, and it says he literally walked out of his body. He walked out when everything that he was supposed to accomplish was accomplished. He said, it is finished, and he walked out of his body. 
And that's the way it can be for us. Regardless of the means, we need to be walking with the Lord now. But I want you to get this now. Nothing can happen in a world created by a sovereign God without His knowledge or without His permission. And it works the same way for us that it worked for Joseph. If I believe God's Word, which tells me that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if I believe God's Word, it tells me that all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord, for those who are the called according to His purpose. If I believe that, I'll be given strength and hope to weather any storm that is sent my way. I agree with Paul, if God is for me, who can be against me? He loves me too much to allow anything to happen to me that's not for my good. He's paid too high a price for me to forsake me, and He is too holy to do wrong. And He has promised to save me, and He has promised to keep me, and He has promised to take me to heaven to be with Him at my death or at His coming. He cannot die, He cannot lie, and He cannot deny Himself. Thus, although Joseph does not know all the particulars, all of the little things that happen, he is in prison by the will of his God. Now, I hope you got that down. hope you have that down. Do you understand this? Now, I would like for you to turn in your Bibles, I'm going to let you turn over there early, to the book of Peter, and I'll tell you exactly where in just a moment. Maybe the brethren at 1 Peter chapter 5, maybe the brethren up there in the control booth can put each verse down, because we're going to cover about 10 verses in 1 Peter 5 in just a moment. Now, let me ask you this. He's in prison by the will of God, whether you want to call it the permissive will of God, the decretive will of God, the prescriptive will of God. He's in prison by the will of God. God knows about it. He predicted, He gave Joseph those dreams that said one day he's going to be made governor of Egypt, and all of his brothers are going to bow down to him. And those dreams are going to come to pass. He did not reveal to Joseph the path by which he would get to the governorship. We are promised heaven. We're promised a place in heaven, but we don't know the means by which we'll get there. We don't know of everything that befalls us, and we don't have to know because He knows. And He works it all out for our good and His glory, and all we do is trust Him. If I may say it this way, all we need to do is hang on to the coattails of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He will work it out. So let me ask this question now. Let me ask a second question. Is there another reason Joseph is in prison? Yes. <laughs> He's in prison because of the slanderous lie of Potiphar's wife. Now look, Jesus came into the world to do what? He came into the world to save a people. The angel said to Joseph and to Mary before Jesus was born, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. That's before he was ever born. Now he's going to try to save him. He'd like to save him. If he's lucky, he'll save him. He wants to save him. He shall save his people from their sins. It's determined, and he's going to save them, every single one of them. But the means by which He will save them, the means by which He gets to the cross. is going to come by means of a betrayal from Judas. And Judas, how did Judas end up betraying Him? The Scripture says, Satan entered into Him at the Last Supper. All of the Jewish people, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, who hated him, who were jealous of him, who were envious of him, they were all playing a part 
But the will of God, the secret will of God, the means by which Jesus is going to get to the cross and redeem his people, that was hidden from people. That was hidden. We don't know what's going to happen to us, but I know this. Again, Joseph is in prison by the will of God, but secondly, he's in prison because of the slanderous lie of the wife of Potiphar. And the Lord's going to use that. Now, what is slander? Well, the short and legal definition of slander is the action or crime of making false statements damaging to a person's reputation. Slander is a false, malicious statement or report about someone. It's not only a lie, it's a lie with a purpose. And the purpose is to injure, to hurt, to trouble, to defame, to damage the reputation and the good name of another. So what I want you to know now is all of the trouble in this world has been caused by slander. As I said to you earlier, slander has a history that reaches back before the foundation of the world, back before men were even made, back before Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And because I want you to understand this most important truth in Revelation, I'm going to introduce you today to this thing of slander, but I'm going to try to enlarge it in the next couple of weeks, and I hope you'll come back and listen. In the meantime, I posed a question in our last study, and I said I'd talk more about it this week. It was something like this. Although this world was created by a holy and righteous creator, there's much wickedness in the world. And often these evil forces in the world gain the victory. And even the prophets were puzzled by this. Jeremiah said, Lord, you are righteous. If I argued my case with you, you would prove to be right. Yet let me talk to you about matters of justice. Why are wicked men so prosperous? Why do dishonest men succeed? That's in Jeremiah chapter 12. Listen to David from Psalm 73. He said, I nearly lost confidence. My faith was almost gone because I was jealous of the proud when I saw that things go so well for the wicked. They do not suffer pain. They are strong and healthy. They do not suffer as other people do. They do not have the troubles that others have. They laugh at others and speak of evil things. They speak evil of God in heaven and give arrogant orders to men on earth. <laughs> so we must not forget what I've already tried to teach you this morning. Our God and our Savior does indeed rule this earth He has created. Nothing can happen that He does not permit. He cares for us, so we can, in the midst of trouble, cast all of our care upon Him. So let's look at 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to spend the rest of our study right here. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me turn over to it. And we're going to look right here at verse 1. Peter has a word for the elders. He has a word for the juniors. He has a word for the flock of God. In the first verse, he says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So what Peter says is, is I want to exhort you, I want to admonish you, console you, encourage you, comfort you, especially as he's speaking here to the elders, the teachers in the church. And he identifies himself with them as an elder. And he says, I was there when our Lord Jesus Christ suffered. And he said, I'm going to partake of Christ's glory in eternity. Now verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, which is an old word for money, 
but of a ready mind. So in verse 2, he's exhorting the elders to feed the flock and lead the flock. And he says, you should take the oversight. You should be the overseer by discipline and by doctrine and by example. You remember Peter probably thought about the Lord's words to him in John chapter 21 after Peter had denied the Lord. You know, when the Lord told Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, oh, no, I'll never do it. And remember, he did. And so in John chapter 21, when Peter and the others were out in the boat, they looked up on the shore, and there was Jesus up there. And this was after his resurrection, after his death, after his burial. And when he went up, when they went up uh, to fellowship with the Lord, this is after his death, he had some fish. And he wanted to eat with them to show them that he wasn't a spirit, that he was a real person. And then he turned to Peter, and remember he said to Peter three times, do you love me? You remember that? That's in John chapter 21. And maybe Peter, when he wrote this epistle, or First Peter we call it, maybe he remembered the Lord's words to him, if you love me, feed my flock. Because he says right here in verse 2, feed the flock of God, which is among you, he says. Feed the flock of God. This must be done, he says, willingly, not because of pride, not because of position, not because of power, and not because of money. And it must be done promptly and heartily of a ready mind. You know, I appreciate everything that churches can do. I appreciate music. Before I was converted, I was in the music business. Love all kinds of music, even today. I appreciate a lot of things that churches do. But one thing is vital in an assembly, and that is that the Word of God must be opened. We mustn't just talk about the Word of God. We mustn't just talk about Jesus. We've got to reveal Him in the Scripture. And personally, I see a lot of churches today on television and so on, I'm unhappy with them. Because they're not opening the Scripture. They're doing everything else. They're making people feel good. They have orchestras. They have all kinds of wonderful buildings, but they're not opening the Scripture. We have to feed the flock. That's what he says here in verse 2. We have to feed the flock. All right, verse 3. He says the elders must not oppress the sheep. They must not lord it over them. And this implies an oppression that's grounded in pride. Verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. You need to remember, we must remember whose flock it is. It's not my flock. It's God's heritage. And he says, if you're going to lead, lead by example, not by dominion. As he says in Titus chapter 2, verse 7, in all things, he says this to the teachers in the church, the deacons and the elders, in all things showing yourself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Then in the fourth verse, he says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. So what he's saying here is always keep the second coming of Christ, the good and the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, in mind. And always remember that when he comes, he will want to find that his sheep have been cared for. Not that the pastors and the preachers and the teachers have used the church to get rich off of it. Now, I just heard a report on television, I just heard it yesterday or the day before, about a person who died who is the teacher in a church worth millions and millions of dollars. Now, I know all the old arguments, well, there's nothing wrong with money. You just don't want to, you know, you know what I tell people? People ask me about money. That's what I tell them, Ty. I say, well, I don't care a thing about money. I says, all those folks I owe, they, they seem to be crazy about it. 
I can honestly say that whatever the Lord has given me, is get, I've gotten it honestly. And I've told you more than many times that when I first came to Tennessee, they said, well, Brother Sasha, we can give you $50 a week. So what did I do? I said, well, I'm going back to Georgia. <laughs> no, I said, look, I'm only concerned about one thing. What is the will of God for me? He will never lead you where he doesn't supply for you. So I got a job. I worked two jobs for a while. And here I am here 51 years later, still know my name, still able to get up. My eyes still work. My ears still work. I still can still talk. I still have all of these things. And the Lord has just blessed us with health and with happiness and with a home, with healings. He's healed us many times of all kinds of ailments from flu to pneumonia to perhaps the coronavirus. I'm saying the Lord will supply for you. But Peter warns these shepherds and says, this is God's heritage. And you need to keep the second coming of Christ in mind because he's the chief shepherd. Now don't get offended with me. He's the chief shepherd, not the Pope. The Pope is not the chief shepherd. The Pope is a sinner that has to be saved by the grace of God. That's what he is. Any person that's a human being must be saved by the grace of God. I had a man tell me, Ty, at your gathering, a pretty powerful man, he said, you know, Bill, I, I talked to him for about 20, 30 minutes. He said, I'm a Catholic in transition. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, I just can't believe all of the things that I've been taught in the Roman Catholic Church anymore. I can't pray to Mary. I don't believe that the Pope has the final word in my salvation. Uh, I don't believe in confessing my sins to a man. I don't believe that when babies die, babies die that haven't been sanctioned by the Roman Catholic Church, they go to limbo. They can't go into heaven. They go to a place called limbo. And that's not a place where they're dancing. It's a place where they have to be purged of remaining sins. And then if adults die, they have to go to purgatory, so-called, because they have to be purged. The, the blood of Christ was not enough to take away all of their sins. They have to be purged of remaining sins, generally by the prayers of the priest and the pope and by the giving of money. My friends, I'm sorry, but that is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. That is not according to the Scripture. Now, Brother Sasser, do you believe Catholics are saved? It doesn't make any difference what I believe. It doesn't make any difference what I believe. If a man is in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saved. If he is not in the Lord Jesus Christ or she, they're not saved. I'm not a fruit inspector. All I'm doing is preaching the truth and preaching the gospel and preaching the Word of God to the best of my ability. The Lord will have to take it and do what He wants to with it. But I know this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I know that. So he says in verse 4, he says, When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory. This crown of glory here is the incorruptible crown of life that doesn't fade away. Verse 5. He says, honor is to be shown to whom honor is due. You younger, submit yourselves to the elder. All of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So what he says here is honor is to be shown to whom honor is due. Originally, the deacons were young men. The word translated deacon means one who serves, those who serve. But he says here, we all should have a spirit of humility. There should be subordination one to another. This is explained by that clause, all of you are to be subject one to another. All of you are to be clothed with humility. Now, why do we have to wear clothes today? Clothing was the original badge of man's sin and shame. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves. And the Lord killed an animal 
and clothe them with the skin and the fur of that animal. That is in the Bible, by the way. Go back and read it. He said, you can't clothe yourself with fig leaves. That's a picture of your own works. But I must clothe you. I, I'll have to kill an animal, the shedding of blood, and I'll use that skin to clothe you. So today we wear clothes. Clothing, listen, these clothes I have on and the clothes you have on are meant to remind us of our original sin and shame against God. And what we do, we turn things around now, and now we make the clothing industry a matter of pride. Pride still reigns in our manner of dress. We took something that we sh should remind us of our sin and shame, and we turned it into a badge of pride. And so now we have fashion shows with both male and female models who grow wealthy through modeling. Well, Peter says here, I want you to be clothed with humility. He said, I want you to strip off the spiritual robe of pride and be clothed in the robe of Christ's righteousness. And to encourage us to do this, Peter reminds us that the Lord is against the proud, but he'll help those who humble themselves. Isn't that what he says? He agrees with James. James says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Solomon says in the Old Testament, he scorns the scorner, but he gives grace to the lowly. So here's my question. How do we humble ourselves? Well, listen again to James. James says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. The way you humble yourself is by submitting yourself to God. Now, Joseph was a man who was clothed in humility. Whatever situation he was in, he submitted himself to the Lord. And what, result, what resulted from that? Verse 6. I'll try to hurry. Verse 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. In other words, you humble yourself to the will of God as you know it. You humble yourself to whatever uh, he sends your way. You humble yourself. You bear it. Call the mighty hand of God. And this mighty hand of God here is the hand of affliction. It's the hand of chastisement. It's the hand of a father who loves you. You remember the old country song, Daddy's Hands? Daddy's hands were soft and kind when I was crying. Daddy's hands were hard as steel when I'd done wrong. Daddy's hands were always gentle, but I've come to understand there was always love in Daddy's hands. It is pride that what says, I don't deserve this. How many times have we all said that? I don't deserve this. That's pride talking. But it's humility that kisses the hand that chastens. It's faith expressed in humbleness that waits for God's visitation of mercy. And while we are waiting, whatever we are suffering, what are we to do? This is where we come to the key here. Verse 7. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I say it again, our God and Savior does indeed rule this earth, and He does love us, and nothing can happen to us which He does not permit. He cares for us, and so we can, in the midst of trouble, cast all our cares on Him. Now, you'll notice in this verse that you have casting, your care, and then He says, He careth for you. Those are two different words. The first word, casting all your care, that's a word for anxiety. Cast all your anxiety because of what you're going through on him. The advantage gained from humbling ourselves under his mighty hand, says one scholar, is confident reliance on his goodness. In other words, if I know he's good, if I know he's gracious, if I know he loves me, I can cast my anxiety on him. I can rely on his goodness and his deliverance. And then it says, he careth for you. That's a different word. 
That's a word there that means the burden that we're bearing, we can lift it off and put it on his shoulders. Mellow is the word. First word is meremna, and the second word is mellow. Take the burden that's on you and cast it on his shoulders. Since he cares for us, we don't have to bear the burden. Now watch this, and I must hurry. He relates the problems of pride and distrust and anxiety, he relates it to the devil. Verses 8 and 9, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So he says that indirectly in some way, the problems that you experience may come, they come by permission, but they may come from the devil himself. Let me ask you this. All of you are familiar with the book of Job. Job suffered. He lost seven sons and daughters. He lost all that he had. He was stricken with boils. Who did all of that? The Bible says that the devil did it. But the Bible says that the devil did it by the permission of God. And so now we read about Job, and what lesson do we learn? We learn that a person who really loves the Lord will continue to serve Him even when things are going backwards. Even when things aren't going like I want them to go, He's still God and He still loves me. And maybe He's doing that as a testimony of His strength in me and through me and by me to others who may be going through something like that. You understand what I'm saying? I hope you do. He says, it was to Peter, in fact, the guy that's writing this epistle, it was to him that Jesus said, Satan has desired to have you, Peter. He has desired to have you that, I might, that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. So he says in verse 8 that we must be fully alert and aware, we must be cautious that when we fall into trouble and trial, we don't sin against the Lord. We have an adversary, an adversary. We have Satan, which means an, an adversary or opponent, and he calls him the devil. This is the word diabolos, which means the slanderer. Be, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, the slanderer, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's like a roaring lion. He is violent, and his appetite for causing trouble for the Lord and his children is as insatiable as the appetite of a hungry lion. And it says he's walking about. He's restless. He's always on the prowl. And it says he's seeking. He's driven by his craving for causing trouble. Whom he may devour. Verse 9. He says we ought to resist him in the faith. How do we do it? I've already told you. We resist the devil when we submit to the Lord. Resisting the devil doesn't just mean you spit out a couple of scriptures. It means you submit to the Lord and you let him fight your battles. Know that little song we just sang today? Jesus, we're depending on you. The devil's a liar. There's not much he can do. He can give us trouble. But we hide in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we submit to God? Well, how do we resist the devil, rather? Well, we put on the whole armor of God. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of priests, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And he says, others have, separ have, have suffered the same thing. There it is right there on the board for you. Your brothers, he says, th that have suffered the same afflictions that are accomplished in your brother. Notice these afflictions are accomplished that is, they have a purpose in them, something God has purposed. Verse 10, it's our job to watch and to resist the foe 
the enemy, and the accuser, the Lord will do for us all that is needed. Verse 10, the God of all grace who's called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ after you've suffered a while. Now, if you live a while in this world, you're going to suffer a while. You're going to suffer a while. You've got to go through death. You have may have to go through some other trials and troubles. That's why we read of people as we get older. We have joints that begin to wear out. We have things that begin to wear out. We have heart problems. We have joint problems. We have all kinds of problems that we never had when we were younger. We're going to suffer for a while. Most of you don't know John Riesinger, but Lynn and I visited John. He was 92, 93 years old. He was up near Syracuse, New York. He'd been put in a nursing facility up there. What did John do when he got in the nursing facility? He started a Bible study. And he told us when we visited him, he said, I'm praying that I'll go to sleep and wake up in glory. But he said, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to suffer a while. And we said, why, John? He said, because I've had it too good. <laughs> he said, I've had it too good. But whatever we suffer, it's only for a little while, and it's not to be compared with the suffering that our Lord endured for our sakes. So he says in verse 10, he says, after you've suffered a while, the Lord will perfect you, he will establish you, he will strengthen you, and he will settle you. If he's called you, he'll sustain you. If he sustains you, he'll keep you. If he keeps you, he'll take you unto himself. Last verse, verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he says, it is to him that all the glory belongs, not to ourselves. So I, I began today with a, a little question, this section of our study, and I'm going to end it with a question. What might be a reason behind the trials of Joseph and behind whatever trials we may endure? Well, one answer is this, that the Lord of glory might get glory for himself in delivering those who are helpless to deliver themselves, but trust him to do so. Can you follow me? One reason for our trials may be that the Lord will be glorified by delivering those who are helpless to deliver themselves, but trust him to do so. In short, if you can deliver yourself, you don't need my Savior. But if you're helpless to do anything about life and death and eternity because of your sin, you are a candidate for the Lord Jesus Christ. He saves those who cannot save themselves. When we were without strength in due time, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I am a sinner. I stand in need of a Savior. How about you? Now what I've done this morning or tried to do was to prepare you for the next couple of studies. And this, these passages in 1 Peter give us good instructions about what to do while we're passing through this world on the way to glory with Christ. And it can be summed up in that little verse, cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. Just because you're going through trouble doesn't mean the Lord doesn't care for you. It means that you need to trust him to deliver you from your trouble, and thereby you will give him glory. May the Lord add his blessings on the teaching of his word. Let's stand together, please. Thank you for patiently listening today. Let me leave you with uh, uh, an, an appeal to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has promised you will be saved. 
Believing on Christ is something that it seems easy to do, but as life comes our way, we wonder sometimes if we've really believed it. You can be baptized so many times that every turtle in every creek in Tennessee knows you by your first name. And that won't have anything to do with your sins. Water does not wash your sins away. The blood of Christ washes your sins away. Plunge yourself into that crimson flood. And there by the grace of God all your sins will be washed away. The Bible uses three tenses about our salvation. It talks about having been saved, being saved, and shall be saved. And if I've been saved, I've been saved through faith. If I'm being saved, I'm being saved by grace through faith. And then in that day when we stand before God and all nations are gathered before Him and He divides the sheep from the goats, then that day I will be saved from being cast off from the presence of God. So I'm saying if you're saved, you're saved by the grace of God through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Scripture says, and you'll be saved. May the Lord bless us. We're going to sing about the blood of Christ. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus. All you have to do is just give me a call. I'd be happy to meet with you, pray with you, talk to you, try to answer any questions you might have. But I would say this, look to the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Run to the Lord. That is the only safe place in this world. For time and for eternity, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. And now may the blessings of the everlasting covenant through the blood of Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, be upon all in the sound under the sound of my voice, Lord. And I pray that you will work in us your good pleasure and your will, working in us that which is pleasing unto you, that one will bring glory to you, and we know it will be for our good. We pray, Father, that you'll help us come weal or woe, come good or evil, to always be found trusting in Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, our substitute, who stood in our very room and stead, took upon himself all of our hail, and gave us his righteousness. This is the life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, for his sake. Amen. If you're a visitor here today, please sign our guest book out there as you go out. Hold